All right, guys. Well, it is four in the morning, and see, last month, last couple months, when I would get this done, like, I'm tired right now. I'm like, fuck. Go to sleep. But I, I ran into that problem the last couple months, and, and I just simply can't do that, you know? If, if I can muster up the strength, I must do a video. Nico's sick today. He just got a cough, runny nose, and I'm freaked the fuck out. I've never been around Nico sick. You know, he's two and a half. I mean, it's the first year. I, li I started crying today. If anything was ever going to happen to him, ever, I would, f I would die. Plus, I missed some spot shaving because I shaved in the shower, and then this is the first time I see myself. And I don't know why, but I have really bad swamp ass today. I can't even, like, jerk off in my office. I'm scared that if I take my pants down that it'll blow the office up and I'll be busted. Okay, anyway, what else is happening? I'm really scared for Nico. I'm going to take him to get tested tomorrow. But, God, I, I just, oh, I can't even, I just can't handle my kid being sick. It freaks me out. Um, I guess the former head of... The Israeli space program said there's aliens. Which is whatever. I just I read that. I was like, oh. Checks out. Alright, let's get into the story. I'm sorry, I'm tired. No monologue today. I'm just too tired. I'm tired. Is that how I sound? I'm sorry. Alright, so let's get into the story. <clears throat> No, let's not. Every time I say that, then I want to keep talking about random shit that has nothing to do with the story. But tonight, what I did is I spent time with Nico, made sure he was okay, worked on the documentary tonight. Um, and there's something else. Oh, yeah, yeah, And then I worked on the Mickey Avalon book. I, I wrote the first chapter of it, and I sent it to him, and he said it was perfect. Um, I'd sent him the prologue already, but now I'm, do I'm done with the first chapter. I'm just flying through that, and that is a fucked up story, seriously. Makes my story look heterosexual. No, I'm just kidding. Mickey's not gay. But, uh, you know, his, he, had a, he had a wild ass life. Why is everything gay or straight with you? What are you, some sort of professional athlete? Alright, this is why I'm not doing the monologue because I just can't say things that make sense right now. I am stoned. My ass is just so swampy. I think that's distracting me. It, like, fucks up my ability to tell stories because I just feel it like... It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right at all. Alright, so let's get into the story. Sorry, I'm just really late and I'm just... I'm really tired. So where we had left off last time is when I had the gnarliest mu mushroom trip... The muffin... Uh, gnarliest mushroom trip I've ever had in my entire life. I mean, really. I've done a lot of hallucinogenic drugs. I really have. Like, I'm not exaggerating. I've probably tripped on acid... I don't know. Three, four hundred times. I'm not even exaggerating that. I, when I was younger, I was a moron with that kind of stuff. I was like, fuck, I'm just gonna do acid every day. I don't care. And then, like, one day, I was like, oh, I don't feel like... I, I think I'm a chick now. And my friend's like, dude. Alright, so there's that. I did used to take a lot of acid. I took a lot of acid in high school. Like, abnormal. That was a dope fiend. I didn't realize it then, but I did a lot more than normal people did. And still to this day, I trip probably more than most 35-year-olds should. Uh, I have found, though, the older that I get with psychedelics, that they do offer insights, you know? I mean, I don't take them like I used to. Before, I just didn't respect them. Trip and go to school. Go to keg parties on mushrooms. I just, I, I viewed it as a drug, and I didn't view it as what it is. It's uh, an indigenous plant that can help demystify the human apparatus. Seriously, it can. I mean, that shit was grown on Earth so that we could eat it from cow shit and think about our lives. Think about how silly that sounds, but that's exactly what it is. But we do. it, it does get very introspective, and you can have some positive changes from... Taking hallucinogenic drugs this time, however, was not the case. And just to refresh your memory a bit, we had stolen a lunch bag full of what we thought were, she said magic brownies on there. 
I didn't know. I didn't know that that meant magic mushroom brownies. I thought it meant there's weed in here. You know, I didn't, I mean, I think it was just because of the sheer quantity of it. I didn't, I just didn't expect to have that many mushrooms in my possession. Soon after we started eating them, having this contest, we were getting cheered on by people. The guy, Josh, this really, really skinny guy. I mean, I say skinny like all the time when I'm describing him, but like, you don't even understand how bad this guy was. There's like some influencer. Do you know who I'm talking about? He's like, um, he's like rail thin. He looks like, um, a character from American. He looks like Roger from American Dad, but skinnier. He's like an influencer. He's always like with these like porn stars and they're like jerking him off on Instagram. And I'm like, how is this allowed on here? This is, what the fuck? And then I hit like. I'm like, I love, I like this. I don't know. Modern times are stupid. Uh, that's what this guy looked like. So, like, already going into it, he was a weird guy to trip with. And also, as I was trying to puke this shit up and the batter was getting, like, you know, clogged in my throat as I was trying to project it out, he was telling me how, much, how I was going to die. He's like, you're going to die 100% for sure. And I was like, what the f Who says that right before we're going to trip? I was like, I've already accepted the fact that I ate way more than I should. I don't know... How many I ate? I think about eight. I want to say that there's a little more than an eighth in each one of these brownies. Now, I did puke some of it out, but the batter gets this, like, weird sticky quality that, like, sticks to your throat, and you can't get it all up. I remember, like, forcing myself to vomit, and this, like, thick black syrup would come out of it. It really looked crazy. It looked like I got shot or something. But it was brownie batter with mushrooms in there. And this guy kept telling me I was going to die. And then my girlfriend came. I was like, oh my God, what if you do die? Fuck. I get your dark side of the moon CD. I was like, oh my God. And like, she was joking. He was serious, but it was hysteria. So we were at her house or, you know, her, I guess an apartment, but it really was like a big house. It was their biggest property. That's where I'd met her at that party the first night. Um, by the way, tonight, I time out real quick. Karina and I were fighting again. We made up, though. We kissed right before um, right before I came down here, like four hours ago, and started writing about Mickey Avalon incest stuff. I was like, this is fun. What do you think of this? He's like, hey, really hit it over the fence, man. I was like, yeah, yeah. And I'm not even joking. Um, and Karina was telling me, she's like, you know what? And she doesn't talk like that. How does she talk? Yeah, dick stinks. She's like, you know what? I hear you when you're doing your videos and you're talking about fucking other bitches. You're a fucking piece of shit. I was like, well, do you think I've never fucked other bitches? She's like, yeah. I was like, I haven't. I know. I just, I just make that shit up. Chicks are gross. She's like, yeah, they are. I can smell your ass right now. So that's why I have my pants on. Usually I do my videos pantless, but... So she gets mad when I mention women that I've had sex with. So from now on, I need to whisper it. That's pretty much what I'm saying. So Kate, uh, she was living at that house. But after we consumed the mushrooms, and I remember this very clearly, it had just started snowing in New England. You know, I don't know what month it was. We probably went out there in September. So I think it was early October at this point. We've been out there for a, for a little bit. And we've been going to these keg parties and these jocks would hit on her. And I was just a bitch. I had like a goatee and long hair. I did not look threatening at all. I looked like I like was really into Nickelback and shit like that. Like I had like some like jean jacket, Nickelback embroidered fan fucking jacket. That's what kind of style I had back then. So anyway... I remember that night it had started snowing. I think it was in October, like I said. And after I had just accepted the fact that I was going to be on these mushrooms, and I told Josh, I was like, dude, I do not want to be tripping while you're telling me that I'm going to die from this. I don't think I'm going to die. You're being a pussy. And he's like, whoa, fuck, I'm going to die. He's like, look at my body. It's, I don't even have one. And he didn't. He looked like a straight-up skeleton or something. It was crazy. Um... But Kate and I ended up walking away from her house. We we're going to walk back to her apartment. So it was walking distance. It was probably like, I don't know, six or seven miles. <clears throat> we did that all the time. She'd sleep over at my place. In the morning, we would walk um, 
back to her place, vice versa. Sometimes I'd be at her place. Sometimes we walked to my place. That particular night, it was snowing. I had to walk like, you know, it was like six miles, like I said, and it was freezing. And being from Southern California, growing up in a beach town, I mean, I was born in Massachusetts. I was born in Boston. It's been my first three years there. But I mean, I wasn't like, I don't remember that. And I just grew up in a beach town where it's pretty much 80 degrees all year round. So being in Worcester, it was particularly, you know, harsh for me to get used to because my mom didn't give me like any warm clothes. She gave me like a beanie and like a long sleeve, not even a thermal. She was like, here, you can have long sleeve, you'll be warm. I was like, sh I remember I was shivering and like my teeth were clattering. Now the mushrooms hadn't kicked in yet, but I just had this like foreboding sense. I knew, I knew that that shit was going to hit me hard. I knew it. You know, I was already starting to get like that. Okay, I've noticed this with mushrooms. It's really, really weird. And I've really never talked about it, I don't think. But, because it's hard to describe. But when I'm on a lot of mushrooms, so psilocybin is a poison. I swear to God. But it has to be a lot. Like, I'm not talking about a couple ounces. I'm not talking about three ounces. I'm talking about like eating a half ounce of mushrooms. Like that kind of shit. When I've been on heavy trips like that, I feel this weird surge of it. It in my mind, I feel like it's the Pac-Man guy, like eating brain cells. But I can like you can like feel these like surges of electricity that kind of vibrate. It's almost orgasmic, and it kind of flutters through your, you know, like it almost electrocutes you. That's just poison just plowing through you. Um. And I remember feeling that this particular night. I had that feeling. My teeth were clattering. And Kate was holding my hand, you know, um, because she knew that I was just about to be straight fucked on the amount of mushrooms. I, we didn't know how many, but it was a lot. Now, I remember, I don't know, maybe a week, two weeks before that. Like I said, we were doing mushrooms frequently, like a few times a week, which is who d does mushrooms like that? It's ridiculous. I don't know what we were thinking. We're like, yeah, our brain will be fine. Like, no way. No wonder I, I fucking freaked out when I was 32 and it was like hallucinating feds coming to get me. It's because of this kind of shit, doing this many psychedelics throughout the years. I remember like a week before, whatever it was, I was all mushrooms one night and I passed out. You know, we, we ended up, she wanted to take about like two in the morning. I'm like, oh, I'm tired. You know, I was like, I'll probably not even, I'm probably going to pass out. But I ended up eating, I think, I don't remember. It wasn't these brownies because this is the first time we had eaten those brownies. But like I had said, I think in an earlier video, we had this neighbor. He reached out to me on uh, Instagram when I did the Al Profit video. I hadn't talked to this guy in like years. It was a DM and uh, he had like a million followers on Instagram. He's like some DJ now. He's like still selling mushrooms. Like says so in his IG profile. I was like, what the fuck? No, I didn't say that, but he did reach out to me. But there was this guy named Aaron. He lived uh, in the apartment below below my apartment. So I lived with that guy, Mark. He was the guy that looked like he was in Airheads or Wayne's World. And we smoked weed together. And that's pretty much it. I mean, he never had girls over. And sometimes I was a dick about it. I was like, hey, man, do you not like pussy or something? And he just looked at me. He's like, I don't objectify women like that. And he, like, put on some Metallica and... Made some sour ass face. I was like, damn, man. I was 18. Every 18 year old doesn't talk like that. I don't care. Unapologetic at this point. I don't say that kind of stuff now. That would be creepy. Like, I don't have adult conversations with my friends. I'm like, hey, man, getting pussy this weekend? That's some really predatory, like, you're putting capsules in women's martinis type shit. And I don't do that ever. I'm against it. It's a good thing to be against. Imagine if you were an advocate for that. I don't know, rape humor, it's pretty, that's tacky, sorry. I remember I passed out that particular night when we had taken the mushrooms. I passed out in her bed at her place. And I remember she kind of like crouched above me. The mushrooms had kicked in for her. And I remember waking up tripping. So I'd fallen asleep before I'd taken them and I woke up. Sure, but I used to do that with acid all the time. We would set the alarm clock for four in the morning. Me and my best friend that was living at my parents' house. We'd take a couple drops of liquid LSD. 
and we go back to sleep so that we'll, when we would wake up for school in a few hours, we woke up straight peaking on the acid. We did that a lot. And both of our lives ended up being really horrible for like the next 20 years after that. He's, he's like homeless now, like legit. He has like a hiking backpack. Like where do you even get shit? Like that's like authentic homeless backpack. Where do you even get shit like that? He has like a walking stick and like a some spotted dog, you know, it's, it wears a bandana as the as the collar. Um, so I've woken up on acid after, you know, going to sleep or whatever, but I'd never done it on mushrooms. And I remember that particular night. This is the week before I took that huge, like eight ounce brownie, whatever you want to call it. And I woke up that, that night and I was looking up at Kate and I remember it was the trippiest thing. Like her face looked like Cheshire cat and it was swirling. I mean, it, it was like a full blown apparition, you know, um, it, it wasn't like her face was melty or distorted. It was cartoonish. It was wild ass looking shit. And I remember just being like completely petrified. And she's like, what baby, what? And she was like kissing me and it looked like she was trying to attack me. It kind of looked like the play cats. Like imagine if, one of those characters trying to have sex with you while you're on mushroom. That's what it was like. She's like, come on, please. She was like grabbing my dick and I, was, I couldn't stop laughing. She kept trying to grab it and it was just making me laugh because that's what happens on mushrooms. You get laugh attacks. Everything makes you laugh on mushrooms. You just think about the fact that when you're on mushrooms, you usually laugh and you'll start laughing because you think that's funny. Shit like that. So this night I started having this. So that was a week before this. You know, and we ended up having a good trip that night. I remember I spent most of the night, like, with, like, a comforter wrapped around me. And I was talking to this, like, older guy. And he's like, I can see pain in your eyes. And, like, at a certain point, I was like, hey, man, who are you? What are you doing at my girlfriend's house? Some old-ass dude. He's, like, 49. We're, like, 18. I was like, what are you doing here, man? Who, like, who are you friends with one of her roommates? He's like, I gotta go. And he just took off. I was like, what the fuck? I don't, to this day, I don't know if that actually happened or not. I, I like that. I think that happened. I was, that's what I saw happen. That's what I remember happening. But I don't know if I was hallucinating or not. So Kate was holding my hand. I'm chattering my teeth. You know, I'm having those electric surges go through, course through my head. And I remember kind of getting lightheaded. You're probably about a mile away from my apartment. And my apartment was located on, um, I think it was called Highland, which is like the main street in Worcester, if I remember correctly. This was in 2002 or three, so it was a long ass time ago. But we started getting into a more commercial area and the, like, the closer we got to my apartment, the light, more lightheaded I got, the dizzier I got, the more I started seeing Technicolor stuff. You know, everything started taking on kind of like a brilliant tint, so to speak. I mean, this was that night. It was snowing in New England. So it was already beautiful when you have like the distorted prism of a psychedelic drug. It makes it really, really cool, in my opinion. I'm a loser, though. But it still hadn't fully kicked in, though, as we're walking through this commercial area. I just remember looking at everything and everything just looked complete. You know, it looked beautiful. Um, all the snow. Um, you know, I saw a bunch of these... East Coast women that look like they're like 50 or 60 years older than their age. And I remember just like thinking about it while I was on the mushrooms, which of course was funny. But I wasn't fully on them yet. So we ended up getting to my um, apartment. I just remember that that walk was absolutely enchanting. It was beautiful. It was like being in, um, I don't know, going down some sort of like rabbit hole and being in some very nice, beautiful place. So we end up getting to my apartment. Mark is there. No pussy. Sorry, Mark, if you're watching. That's true. It's like, God, man, there's all these women that look middle-aged that aren't. <laughs> Go have sex with them. I'm sure it won't be that hard. And he's like, oh, I like Metallica. It's like, me too, but I also like girls. I don't know. That's like pretty fucking normal. We're 18. Go on, man. He just would never do it. So I saw him. And Kate told him that I was on uh, probably eight 
maybe more ounces of mushroom. She explained to him what had happened. And he's just like, you know, he was like one of those guys that like, you wouldn't even be arguing with him. And he'd just get like concede to you. I'm like, yeah, I'll probably be on the mushrooms. He's like, yeah, fine, all right, you can have the living room. I'm just go in my room and chill, man. I'm gonna listen to music. You win, man. You win. Bye. He put his head down. I was like, Jesus, man, take a Prozac or something. It was really, it was almost embarrassing to have company over there. Like I wasn't even though Kate was my girlfriend, I was still kind of embarrassed. This dude was kind of a J cat. So I remember she puts on music on the stereo. And it was sublime. I remember she put on Santeria. Now the mushrooms were like kind of kicking in. And that's another thing. When you take a fat dose like that, for some reason with mushrooms, it takes a little longer for like the big ass dose to kick in. But when it does, it rocks you. It, it, you can go to some, which I did on this trip. You can go to some crazy ass places in your mind. So she got naked. I ended up getting naked and, uh, <clears throat> But I was like, gross, put that on. So we danced naked to Santeria. And uh, it was actually like a really beautiful moment in my life. Looking back on it, it was like, you know, it was the, the moonlight was kind of peeking in the windows. She was naked. That always made shit better for me, I don't know. And we just had this kind of like tender memory that we made that I still remember. So then, after that point, um, I hear Karina walking. That's crazy, because it's like 4.30 in the morning. I hope Nico's okay. I should definitely ask. It's Is he alright? Hey? What? Is he okay? I can't hear you, Ben. Let me get back to this video. I don't know. I think she was talking shit, so I just was like, I can't hear you, I gotta go. No, she said he's okay. I can hear that. What she said after that. Oh, there you go. And out of the sore throat, this looks good. Okay, so, um, after we had danced, I went and I sat on this like old couch that I don't even know where we got it. Probably at like a thrift store or something. I really do have a sore throat. So I think we got it at a thrift store, but we had this like old shitty couch. It didn't matter. I was sitting on that couch. The only post, we had two posters up at this place. We had a fear and loathing. I'm remembering this right now. We had a fear and loathing in Las Vegas. And we had this Kurt Cobain poster that like said his, you know, 19 whatever to 1994 or whatever it was and so i'm sitting down on the couch now i can't remember the detail of why kate wasn't with me at this point of the story but i remember being alone at this point and this is right when the mushrooms were kicking in there was music playing on the stereo i'm pretty sure it was the beatles and i was looking at this poster of kurt cobain you know, typical Kurt Cobain, like, sullen looks of, uh, corporate rock is whack. You know, that, that like, sour face that he would make. And everyone's, like, idolized him for it. They're like, man, his depression's so dope. So I'm looking at him. And I started seeing some of the features move. Lines on his forehead kind of squiggled alive, you know? I kind of started seeing, like, his nose twitch a bit. His lip had, like, a very light snarl to it. He basically came to life while I was listening to the Beatles. I was like, and I remember just sitting there on the shitty old couch, looking at the poster, and he was looking at me, you know, because the picture was him, like, with his, like, eyes closed, and, like, very slowly, his eyes just opened up, like, a van triloquist doll or something and he's looking at me and i'm just like and i look back at him because i'm thinking at that i'm like i'm probably hallucinating i don't think Kurt Cobain just came to life in this poster but then after looking around and looking back at him i noticed that he was kind of moving now like he swang 
And he just kept nodding at me over and over again. So I nodded back, naturally. I mean, I felt like he was trying to say something to me. I didn't know how to really deal with that situation. Because when you're on those kind of drugs, you do lose control at a certain point. Like, I didn't have the ability to think a certain way. I just, like, it makes sense to you all of a sudden. You're like, yeah, this makes sense. This poster's fucking pretty much communicating me with body language. So what? And I remember this had to have gone on for, like, you know, I don't know, because time on when you're tripping on mushrooms like things seem much longer um than they are to me if i had estimated it was about an hour i'm like going through this entire like beatles like six cd and like some like you know revolving cd player because we had that on the stereo listening to like the beatles entire catalog the whole time Kurt Cobain is nodding at me what happened is that Kate came back at some point. So she had left me there for a while. I don't know why. But when she came back, I couldn't see her features. And this happened to me a bunch of times when I was tripping. This happened to me that time that I was at that rave in San Francisco as well, where the face just becomes featureless. That was like a reoccurring hallucination that I've had probably since I was... This is probably the first time... No... I remember a time when I was 16 that happened to me too, but it was like a reoccurring thing. And I don't know if I had ever told you guys about the mescaline incident, but let me be off for a second real quick. I don't know if I've ever told you this. Though. So when I was 18, when I was, when after I'd stolen those savings bonds, I started running out of money at a certain point. And I realized that you could write yourself checks at the grocery store. Even if you didn't have money in your account, when the grocery store would give you cash. That is not legal. That put me on check system. I still don't have like a adult bank account. I have an investment bank account, but I don't have like a functional one where I can have a debit card. I can just pretty much put money in there. And that's it. And once it's there, I'm like, hey, can I get some of my money out? They're like, nope. I'm like, okay. The same in next week, Marv. Thanks, man. You got it, big guy. <laughs> you know, kind of hustle me. So what had happened is I was living at this apartment right next to Santa Barbara High School. I was 18. Kate lived with me. And I started getting into shooting coke. Got really into it. We'd always have these, like, degenerates at our house that were, like, addicted to shooting coke. And that's a rare thing. Think about an entire pack of coke-shooting zombies where they didn't do other shit. They weren't heroin addicts. They just shot coke. That's it. What a weird-ass addiction. That You want to know people that are doing armed robberies at gas stations. It's your IV coke users. Very shitty demographic, for sure. And at a certain point, when these guys are always at my house... People are asking for acid. There's a reason I'm telling you this backstory because it has to do with the thing we're about to go back into. Acid disappeared at a certain point. In 2001, 2002, when I was in high school, it was fucking everywhere. Everybody had acid all the time. Even people that you didn't think would have acid. You'd be like at your friend's house at a sleepover and their mom would be like, hey man, you want some acid? You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody had it when I was in high school. The first two or three years and then it seemed to just vanish instantly overnight now i didn't know then that you know 16 17 years later maybe not that far but maybe 10 years later i was going to be at victorville with a guy named clyde who was part of that underground missile asylum in kansas that the D's, dda said was responsible for 98 percent of the global lsd trade they're making it down in this bunker. Really interesting story. And I ended up meeting one of the guys involved with it when I was at Victorville. He was the driver, but he was doing a life sentence for it. It was crazy. He tells wild ass stories about that uh, missile asylum, the bunker that was underground, you know, because they had like all these hookers and they'd have like these crazy like orgies where they like fed each other grapes, and butt fucked each other. It was crazy. When they got busted, that was in 2001, I believe. All of a sudden, acid dried up. By like, oh, three, you couldn't find it anywhere. It was, it was odd. 
it, it like went extinct and nobody really knew why i mean it wasn't like common knowledge. it's not like now we're like you can find out every you can find out you know uh all sorts of crazy shit just on reddit stuff like that so we couldn't find we didn't know why they didn't have it and i knew this guy mike that i had gone to that program in utah with he was an acid head like the misfits like um suicidal tendencies he told me for the longest time that he murdered somebody it's like yeah yeah i did i hit someone with a golf club one time i fucking smashed his brains and i was like 13 yeah i left his body at the strip mall huh never got caught you tell me that all the time I'm like dude i don't i don't believe you i don't think that ever happened I'm just go yeah, why wouldn't it why wouldn't it have happened i was like i don't know if it did you shouldn't be telling people you weirdo I don't know if that was true, but he claimed that he had killed somebody. So he had always told me that he could get acid when we were, you know, together in Utah. Because that's what you do when you're in a place like that. You talk about doing drugs back home and you guys are just kind of like, whoa, I can't wait to get back and do this, this, or that, you know? So when I was living at this house and we were all shooting coke, I decided to give this guy a call. See if maybe he had some acid. You know, people... Sometimes stash away a vial or something, and you can still get some, and that's always how you find it when you can't, you know, you hit up random people that used to have it, and maybe someone still has some. So he answered, and he told me that he did, in fact, have a vial, and that he would sell it to me for 100 bucks. Now, again, I didn't have, I had gone broke at this point. This was after the savings bond, and I was just cashing bunk checks at the grocery store. So I ended up getting $100. I went with my friend Jesse down to L.A., we met up with this guy, Mike, in an In-N-Out burger parking lot, and he gave us a sock with a little breath drop vial of acid for 100 bucks. And I was like, how do I know it's real? And he, he was like being all shifty as fuck, too. He's like, oh, I gotta go. And I like told my buddy, Jay, I was like, that guy told me he killed someone. My friend was like, hell no, that guy's way too scary to do shit like that. So we ended up driving back, and Jesse, he was that guy, he was a senior when I was a freshman, he was like pretty much the person that introduced me to all my older friends that ruined my life. My parents hate him. No, my dad plays golf with him now. He ended up kind of chilling out as we got older. But, um, I remember we were in the car and I was like telling, I was like, Jesse, that guy said that he killed somebody, you know? And, and like I just said, I'm just repeating myself. Jesse's like, the guy's way too scary to do that. So I apologize. I'm stoned. And I just repeated that. Um, when we were driving back, though, what I meant to say is that Jesse told me that I should try it. I don't want to, I, I was like, you know, doing drops of liquid LSD is always a commitment. You're talking about 14 to 16 hours, sometimes an introspective hell. We're just thinking about what a piece of shit you are for 16 hours in a row. It's not like afterwards, you're like, dude, I'm in the best mood, you know, we should, okay, so brain's like malfunctioning right now. um so he kind of talked me into taking three drops you know i should have taken one i didn't know how this stuff was going to be and we you know we're an hour and a half from la so eventually we get about 30 minutes from my place and every all these like coke shooting people were waiting for me at my house everybody's excited to do the acid everybody was still relatively young at that point and so I convinced Jesse to take what I had taken, take three hits when we were about 30 minutes from my place. So he was driving and, you know, he drove like his mom's minivan, even though he was like 19 or 20 at the time. And, um, and he ended up taking three as well. So now both of us had taken three hits of this well. We get back to my place and over an hour has gone by for me. Not smoking. Okay. Over an hour had gone by for me, and I wasn't feeling anything. So I told them that when I got there. I was like, look, um, you know, I'm not, I think that it's bunk. You don't ever want to tell that to a group of people that are waiting for drugs. Like when you're the guinea pig and you're like, hey, man, uh, I don't think this shit's going to actually do anything to us. So everybody was super pissed off about it. But, of course, being dope fiends, everybody still wanted to take it anyway. So everybody just starts taking a bunch of drops of this stuff. I'm pouring some on sugar cubes on the table. 
and my black friend Dorian. Oh, I have to say it like that. Why can't he just be my friend Dorian? My black buddy. My friend Dorian um, wanted me to, you know, I think I owed him like 50 bucks at the time. And he wanted me to clear him out by giving him like 10 of these sugar cubes with the drops of the supposed acid on it. So I was trying to do that for him. We got sugar cubes out. We had some aluminum foil and I was squeezing the breath drop vial and I guess I squeezed it too hard and like the little tip of it came off. So all the liquid just fell on my table. He's like, dude, 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 let me lick it. Let me lick it. And uh, then you don't owe me money anymore. It was going to just, you know, it, I, it, I just wasted all of it. So he got on the table and he just started licking all of this stuff up. None of us thought it was going to do anything, and I ended up going into my bedroom. I started getting a really, really, really bad stomach ache. The worst stomach ache I've ever had. Like, I felt like I was going to die. Um, I was nauseous. My stomach hurt. Felt like I'd been poisoned. I started throwing up, and they were like these really loud, like, roaring vomits. Like, Bleh! that kind of shit. I was, like, dying. Right after I puke, I look up and I had one of those Pink Floyd posters with all the, you know, there's like naked girls and there's different album covers painted on their backs or whatever. I was looking at that poster and I saw it start to smoke. So I just saw like wisps of smoke, like kind of breathing within this painting or this poster that I had. Not if it was a poster. I was like, oh shit. It's real. And I remember I went outside, you know, and I was like telling them all. Jesse's stomach was already hurting at this point. Remember, he had taken it after me. Um, and he was curled up. So we knew that there was something up with it because everybody that was taking it was getting super sick. Um, this guy, um, Dorian, he really started tripping. And we ended up going up to a place in Santa Barbara called the T-Bulls. Which is like a secret skateboard spot in Santa Barbara. It was this old property way up in the in the hills in Santa Barbara. And it was a property that was so big. It was like a 75-room mansion. This was back in like the 30s and 40s when the Great Depression was going on. But there was like seven wealthy people in the United States. This was one of them. And this place was so big. They had their own amphitheater outside for people to come perform. For the peasants to come juggle for them and shit. They had their own reservoirs for the dot for the water because that's how much water this property required. And those reservoirs were made out of concrete. Skaters had gone there in the 80s, blown it up with dynamite, and then gotten um, other like concrete and kind of like turned it into a makeshift skate park because this property had been abandoned. It's just some big private property out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, up in the mountains in Santa Barbara. And so everybody had gone there. That's where everybody went to go trip. It took like 30 minutes to hike up there. We all went there um, and we ended up losing Dorian, my black friend. Um, you he, you can also see him if you've looked at some of the raw cop busters footage. So Dorian went missing. And we're like out in, like in a desolate ass spot. Like we took a car up there. We're all tripping balls at this point. Like I am having some of the most intense like visuals of my entire life i remember everything like all the plants and stuff look holographic and it like looked like it was composed from like lasers and shit it was wild you know it looked like i was in some sort of digital fortress or something and we lost dorian you know jesse was like on his own trip he was like pushing some rock and he was like i can move the world with my hands I was like, We're, aren't you concerned about Dorian? He's going to get like, he's going to get killed in the woods. And that was like a real possibility. There's mountain lions and shit. So we lost Dorian. Never found him. And eventually we gave up because we were all tripping and we didn't want to be there after dark. It's just starting to get dark. So we left him up there. Well, somehow he made it back to um, his mom's house. She lived in a condo. I don't know how, because we're talking about like 15 miles away from where we were. And he went inside and he tried to kill his sister with a butcher knife, like an SLC punk. But it was my black friend, Dorian, not a punk rock guy. And I guess he, like, he thought she was plotting on him or something. And, like, he pulled out a but like a kitchen knife, like the kind that Michael Myers had in Halloween. And he was, like, chasing her around, like, trying to kill her with it. Just like an SLC punk.
Um, and he actually ended up getting committed to a psych ward. Now, later we would find out that Later, we would find out that um, that what we had taken was mescaline, and that it wasn't acid. So it was just this whole thing. And Dorian was never the same again. Never the same again. I mean, I think he's normal now. Last time I saw him, he was like, he, he was working at like a pharmacy. Uh, he was like working behind the cash register. And I saw him and we were talking. He's like, what have you been up to? And I was like, I just got arrested for pimping and pandering. He's like... Oh, you know, we didn't talk for a long time. It was kind of a weird update to give him about my life. I was like, my girlfriend's pregnant, though. I sold the rights to my book. It's going to be a movie. Even though that was like years ago and it still hasn't happened. He started acting really weird after that. So right around that time, um, I had, um, I had turned 18. Dorian and I... When I say he started acting different, I'm not talking about he was, like, a complete weirdo. Like, I don't think he ever hurt anybody, but he was just different after that point. You know, he started, like, talking with a Latino accent. It was the weirdest shit, because he was some whitewashed black dude. It was weird. And that was just a little phase that he went through. But one night, around that time, after this trip had happened, after he was a little cuckoo, we were wasted. We were at a keg party together. And yes, all of this has to do with the mushroom story. We're going to get back there, but it's the utmost important that I tell you this. We were drunk and we decided to go to IHOP. Now, we had money. We both had money in our pocket. But we were drunk and I thought that it would be funny if we dine and ditched. So when we get to the IHOP, we see this guy. I forget what his name was. I wish I knew because I'd put his bitch ass on blast, but he was like the the host at IHOP. And I'd been in um, like welding class with him in high school. I think his name was Anthony. His name was Anthony. He used to work at IHOP. He's like, oh, hey. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Dorian. Uh, where would you like to go? I was like, let me get a booth. We were so drunk, though, we didn't put it together that this guy would like be able to identify us. I mean, we didn't feel like we were doing some sort of jewelry heist. We were just trying to dine and ditch at IHOP. So I ordered all sorts of crazy shit. I got like the T-bone steak and eggs with an extra uh, side of hash browns. I got the funny face. I was just straight smashing shit. And we made our plan. We're like, all right. When I count to 10, we both get up and we'll dart out of here. We'll get away with it. Dine and ditch. So that's exactly what we did. We did a countdown and we just started running. Now that's not the way to do it. We should have calmly, hey, go to the bathroom and then just walk out. And then I would have done the same thing. But like, it was almost like we wanted to antagonize these people. So we started running down the street and they start chasing us out of there. You know, they're like, hey. So now that guy, Anthony, who is a lot taller than us and he was, a, you know, a heavier set guy, he was just chasing us down the street. And I look back and I see him capture Dorian. And I was like, damn, they got my friend. <laughs> At least it's not me. And I just kept going. You know, I didn't want to get busted. So that had happened right before I went and moved to Worcester. You know, Dorian lost his mind. And then he got captured when we were trying to dine and ditch at IHOP. I didn't know what the penalty for such a thing would be, but I'd imagine that if you get chased out of it and you get caught, that it's probably a pretty harsh penalty. I didn't know, but I didn't follow up on it. I ended up moving out to Worcester. With that being said, nothing had ever happened with the dine and ditching thing. So now I'm in Worcester and I'm at my apartment and... I started having this really insane mushroom trip where Kurt Cobain was nodding at me. And then Kate comes and tries to, you know, comfort me, but I'm, I can't see her features. She just looks like some beam of energy, completely faceless, you know, abstracted by light. And it was freaking me out, you know? And I remember grabbing onto her, not in like a violent way, but I kind of like glided through the house 
put, and she's like, what are you doing? And I was like, you have to go in my bedroom. And I went and I just closed the door on her. Um, and she's like, let me out of there. Now I had no way of locking it. So this went on for, I don't know, maybe 45 minutes where I was like holding the door shut because I thought she was evil. I thought that this like light that was like emanating out of her was like some sort of like demonic force. And that's the kind of stuff that I was thinking inside of my mind. So she's screaming, she's rattling the doorknob. She's, she's like telling me what a piece of shit I was. Let me go, let me go. We we're on the second story of this big brick building. So like there was no way for her to get out of there except for the door that I was holding. I was like literally not letting her go. And she's probably cares about 25 to life. That is kidnapping right there. I mean, she was my girlfriend. She knows tripping balls on mushrooms. So she, the yelling drowns out eventually because I hear these other noises and they're like, kind of like, I don't know, like slot machine noises, like some sort of like, ding but it's melodic so it's like not that annoying it's like duh, 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 you know shit like that and then i just hear these like weird ass noises like that i don't even know if i'm doing them right but it sounded like some like deep groan coming from the other side now she wasn't crying anymore i'm just hearing Arr! Arr! and it was absolutely catatonic for me the way that I was being I mean I like could not move I was so petrified of these noises that were coming from the other side of the door finally in my mind I was thinking that something probably happened to her and I was like and I, I really did love her so I was I felt obligated to protect her in some sense so I ended up opening the door at a certain point once those noises were seeping through it there was no longer resistance from her end I open the door, and all I see is my bed. I'm like, what the, f she, there's no way she could have gotten out of the window. There's no way. Um, I had a little small closet in there, and I had a bed. And my bed was basically just two king-size mattresses stacked up on top of each other, so it's not like there was like an area for her to hide under. It was really tripping me out. And I remember looking out the window, like in my mind, because I'm chirping on mushrooms, everything is like very exaggerated. Everything, I'm like hyper aware. I remember kind of like looking down. It was so, it was so far down there, you know, it was probably like, I don't know. I'm not good with, uh, with heights or like how tall things are, but if you jumped from there, you'd get killed. Let's put it that way. Um, and I remember in my mind, I could kind of visualized that this had already happened like I was going to look out the window and I was just going to see her like body and like some weird like chalk pose but there's nothing or it's just the sidewalk uh covered in snow so now I'm, I'm tripping out you know um I go back into the apartment and the best way that I can describe what was going on there is everything took on this like very witchy um dark ambient feeling it was almost like being on like the pirates of the caribbean ride but i was completely tripping everything just seemed really ominous i was looking at the light it looked like an old like you know uh lantern flickering and i couldn't find kate and i was freaking the fuck out um i remember i started crying at that point because everything was so surreal and it was the kind of thing where I really started losing grip with reality because it wasn't like being on acid or being on a smaller amount of mushrooms where you look at stuff and it gets wavy or melty or whatever. Again, this was one of those trips where I was having full blown apparitions. I probably had eight ounces of the mushrooms and I'm looking everywhere for her. And then I start getting in my mind that she's probably giving Mark a blow job. I don't, you know, he's never, shown any interest in women before but in my deranged mushroomed out mind again just like when I kind of could picture her what it would look like if she had jumped out the window I was thinking about Mark getting his dick sucked by her and it just made me fucking furious so I remember going into, you know, his room didn't have a lock on it. And I remember just opening the door and he let, he's like in his boxers curled up on his bed. And I go up to him and I put my 
hands around his throat and I was like, where is she? And he's petrified. His eyes look like they were going to pop out of the socket. And, um, he's like, I don't know what you're talking about, man. He's like, are you all right? I was like, no, I know that you're getting your dick sucked by my girlfriend. I was convinced by it. So he had to get up and he had to kind of calm me down. So now he was up and he was aware that I was tripping, uh, on the level that I was. And, uh, he was like, you know, he grabbed a flashlight and he was helping me. We didn't have a big apartment. This is a little small two bedroom shithole in Worcester, Massachusetts. It's not like we were living in some luxury condo. Um, but he's helping me look for her. Even though we could turn the lights on, he just decided to start looking for her with like the beam of the flashlight, which made the whole thing even crazier. Um, I'm exhausted right now and I'm gonna cut this video, but I wanted to get you guys something and I will continue the story tomorrow. I hope, I promise, I'll try. Palabra.